over three things today, or we're going to try hard to go over three things today. And uh, if we don't go over one, um, we will uh, pick it up next week. But um, we're going to spend, actually, I was going to write down four things. We're going to do four things real quick. We're going to do a review of the CSS that we have covered for layout. We're going to talk about grid layouts. We're going to talk about Flexbox layouts. Then we're going to spend some time designing for mobile devices. So I'm hoping to get through all four of these. If not, we will leave this one uh, till next time. So I have some examples I downloaded. Um, so far, we have gone over several different ways to have a layout on a web page. We have, and we did one prototype several different ways. And as I mentioned, each one of those has their own situations where they apply. In addition, you may be called upon to work on a website that uses one of these, even though that is not your preferred way of doing things. The first prototype we had was where we use simply the flow. In other words, we counted on the fact that these, these uh, uh, block tags stack on top of each other. And with a little manipulation of the border and margins and so on, we get a website that looks reasonably good uh, without a lot of CSS. We then went to This style, which was the same as the first one, except we use percentages and a minimum width. So we set it at, I think, 60 or 70% of the screen, maybe 80% of the screen. But we set a minimum width that beyond a certain amount, it would not get any smaller, would not get any narrower. Next example we went over was a fixed design where we special where we we specified the position as absolute and we gave each one of these a top and a left attribute. This is good if you have a very precise layout that you want. The first two examples that I gave would be very good if you had sort of a simple page with not many, or a simple site with not many links and so on. This one I would say would be good if you had a very rigid layout that you wanted your pages to precisely follow. We then had the fixed layout where we can, I think I opened the wrong one. the fixed layout where we fixed this at a certain position on the screen and it will stay there even as we scroll the other stuff. That one's nice because it puts the navigation in a constant spot and the user can scroll around the page without losing the navigation. Notice that all of these, besides the layout, we did some other thing. Like these are links that actually kind of look like buttons, which is kind of neat. And then finally, we had a floating layout. And the, the whole idea of a floating layout is we specify to float left typically. And what that means is it sees if there's enough space on the same line to put the next block of, of uh, stuff on. And if it does, it'll put it alongside it. Otherwise, it will drop it below. So example, this, as we make the screen narrower, it makes it smaller to a certain break point, then it stacks them on top of each other. This is moving in the direction of making a website uh, designed for mobile sites, because typically in a mobile site, you want there to be like some, just one column of stuff on your web page.
Any questions about any of these techniques? I would advise you to try a couple of them and get, you know, you have, you have so many assignments, you might as well try a few of them just to see which one you like and which one uh, is easier to use, which ones gets you the certain desired results. Okay, next we're gonna look at is the grid layout. And I have a couple resources here about the grid layout that we'll take a, a glance at, but really you should review these on your own. This is grid by example, which has examples of grids, example of patterns with fallbacks for older browsers, resources, and so on. I usually, the way I like to learn, and this is just a personal preference, is I like to just sort of jump right to the examples. I mean, sometimes the reading stuff is good, but if I wanna just get a quick idea of how to do something, go to the examples. So this example shows you how you have a grid that looks like this. And it will show you that you have your HTML is simply a collection of divs and your CSS simply has a style rule built for the wrapper. The wrapper being a div that goes around all of these. And we specify that the display for this wrapper is a grid and the template columns are 100 pixels, 100 pixels, 100 pixels, and the gap is 10 pixels between them. So if we do that, what it will do is it will make a, a, a grid that has three columns in it, put 10 pixels between them, and that each, each uh, grid segment is 100 pixels wide. If you notice, doing something this way is much easier than trying to do this any of the other methods we've discussed so far. Grids are very popular uh, in all sorts of graphic designs, and uh, especially on websites, especially when we look at ways that we can extend this, because this is assuming each cell of the grid is the same size, but sometimes you might have a row that goes across the whole top of the screen, or a column that goes down two, uh, two horizontal sections or so on. And we'll see examples of that. Here's an example of where you can span a column. Same sort of HTML, but the CSS says that normally we want three columns but A goes from one, the section that has a class of A covers columns one through two. Now this is one thing I find confusing because the grid column says one through three, and that really means it does the first two columns. So it does like one less than what that ending number is. So it would make sense to me if that said one to two, but it doesn't, it says one to three. So in other words, this now, the grid was designed with three columns, but this particular blob takes up two of the three columns, and then this one takes the third column. All right, let's look at the example, uh, or wait, we have a couple more resources I wanna look at. This sort of gives you all the details if you're interested and you want to do a deep dive into this. Display grid, grid template columns, grid template rows, and it shows you, again, all the details of how to set up a grid if you want to do something that isn't covered by one of the examples. The next thing is, can I use? This is a valuable website in general, not just for the grid view, but what this does is this shows you about browser support. Now, what do I mean by browser support? That 
what I mean is if you use some of the newer features that are in HTML or CSS, there's always a possibility it won't work on older browsers. All right. And that's one thing that's that's a little frustrating as a web developer is you don't have any control over how people are using how people are visiting your site. They may be using a really old PC that has Internet Explorer installed on it. They might be using a mobile device. They might be using a game console and so on. So you don't have any control. And especially when you're using the newer versions, sometimes old browsers don't support the newest code for CSS or HTML. This shows you which browsers support and which browsers don't support. So notice the two top list items, most search features. We can look at CSS Grid and we can see what versions of the browser support it and what versions don't. And then you can make some decisions based on what versions it supports or not. What this is saying is that from Chrome version 57 on, it supports it well. That's what the, the, the really green green looks like. I don't know if you can tell that on the monitor or not or on the screen, but that's a very green looking green. The, the more olive looking green is what's called partial support, which means it does some of it, but not all of it. So there might be some features about a grid that, that Edge version 12 through 15 doesn't support. And then finally, Internet Explorer, six through nine doesn't support it at all. 10 and 11 support it somewhat. No version of Opera Mini supports it. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that we're never going to use something unless it's supported across all browsers? No, but we're going to have a backup plan. All right. We're going to test it on as many machines as we possibly can. Usually when I create a website, I'll ask my friends to go and visit it and tell me how it looks on their browser, you know, because I don't have a hundred different computers with a hundred different browsers on it. All right. This actually allows you to test on a real browser. So we can test. Oh, we have to sign up. We can test using uh, this tool as well. But this, this, go, this does give you a sense of what browsers support it, and then you can make the call. What I would suggest is in addition to looking at this, you would look to see at percentage of users. So let's just do a quick search of percent users that use Internet Explorer. These statistics are not necessarily 100% accurate, but they give you a pretty good idea. Sometimes you can gather statistics on your specific site if you want. So let's look at this link. What this is going to tell us is that they retired the site. Internet Explorer has this percentage of usage. If you look at this between uh, that Samsung Internet, you have to get it right on it, I think. And that is an Internet Explorer. Oh, Internet Explorer is. I wish they, there was just a table of the data. Oh, there is. Duh. 
What this is saying is 62% of people use Chrome. Now, this is a, just a, 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 this is not a precise number, and it could vary if you have a specific kind of site that appeals to a specific community. For example, if you had a web development site that appealed to web designers, you probably would get people using more recent browsers than if you had a regular site that anyone in the world might want to access. Well, this can help you make decisions about whether you're going to use a feature or not. Again, if, if a particular group of people, if there's a low percentage for, uh, for a browser that doesn't support a feature that you want to use, it doesn't mean don't use it. It means make sure that there's a fallback plan. Let's look at my example of the grid view. All right, it's a page about Star Wars. This was done completely with the grid view. This would be very difficult to do. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. It wouldn't necessarily be difficult, but it would take a lot more code to do this using any of the techniques that we've done so far. Let's look at what we've done in this case. And then we have index two that has a slightly different layout. We'll look at each of these. I have my header nav section, bunch of sections, and finally a footer. Then I specify a wrapper. Sometimes these are called containers. These go around all the stuff that we want to put in a grid. Let's look at the CSS rule for this. I specify that the wrapper is going to be displayed as a grid. There's going to be 10 pixels between each section of the grid. The minimum width is 600 pixels, and the grid template columns are going to be 20%, 30%, and 30%. But then I specify that the header starts at one and ends at four. Again, remember when we specify the ending, column, the ending column, it's one less than that. So this goes through columns one through three. The navigation starts in row two and ends on row four. So let's look at these one at a time. Remember the header goes from section uh, uh, portion one through three. So notice how the header goes across, oops. The header goes across all three columns. The navigation goes through column or a row two through four. And the footer is going to go through row one through three also. It starts at row five, and it's this. It starts at row one, or it starts at column one, and ends on column four. So when you think of a grid, don't think of necessarily a very regimented grid that's simply a table of data. You can actually manipulate the starting and ending columns, the starting and ending rows, to get any sort of layout that you want to. All right, let's look at the second example. It 
HTML looks similar, except there is only one section instead of multiple sections. This has two columns. First column takes up 20% of the width. The second column takes up 70% of the width. 10 pixel gap between it. And the header starts at one and ends in column three. So it covers columns one through two. So does the footer. So what we end up with in this second example is <laughs> a grid layout that sort of matches in functionality what we've done before with both the floating and the fixed layout. All right, with both, if we went back to our other examples with both the floating and fixed layout, we had a layout very much like this, where we had a banner on the top, navigation on the side, a section, and then finally a footer that extended across the whole width. Because of this, if you are starting something from scratch, the grid layout is really a nice way to go. All right. Really a nice way to go. Any questions about the grid? Let's look at the flex box now. With flex boxes, we also have some resources. CSS flex. With the flex box, you have these lined up eight side by side. They get smaller. Or you can say flex box flex box wrap, get rid of this. I don't see the difference that that makes. Flexbox is not supported in Internet Explorer 10 or earlier versions. Again, by now that should be pretty old. All right, let's look at an example that I have of the Flexbox. Again, here's more information on it. Other examples, but let's look at my example. These both the grid and the flexbox example are included in this use for layout. Now, a few things could be done. I could have put more space in between these, but notice how this works. It does work similar to the float in that when there's enough space, it will put these things side by side. Uh, this, uh, this is a very small screen, so I can't do it. But if you run it on a bigger screen, you, I believe you can get even three columns here. But definitely, if you make the screen narrower, it will drop that down below, which is, again, is another step in moving towards making your site be optimized for a mobile site. Let's look at the code that does this. The HTML embedding is the same as the other example.
There's also a wrapper, again, which serves the, the, the purpose to define where the Flexbox section of your page is. This, if you notice, has even less CSS code. We simply define that the display is flex and the flex wraps is to wrap things around, which means that if it gets too big for the screen, it will drop it down to the next line. Other than that, there's really nothing to do with the layout anywhere else in the CSS code, only in the header. If we say no wrap, then it will stay two columns regardless how small we make it. Oh, actually, it put it may, <laughs> not two columns, it puts all eight of them, all eight or however many of the columns we have on a line. So we probably don't want to do that in this case. If we say wrap, it kind of works like the float. If there's enough space for it, it'll put it alongside of it. Otherwise, it drops it down on its own line. Again, you could use this. You could implement a layout that looks like this using the float, but this is just a lot cleaner as far as the code goes. If I were doing things from scratch these days, I would either use the grid or the flex box. Um, it might take you a little while to get your head around it, but it will give you sort of the best results. And what, maybe it's just because I'm used to the other ones, but the other techniques I think might be a little easier to understand, but the grid and the flex box, at least in my mind, produce better results. All right, last thing we're gonna do is talk about designing for mobile. And I have examples of that here as well. Is there any question about the flex box, by the way? Look at the mobile example. I have two versions of the same thing. One that uses one style sheet. I'm sorry, one that uses two style sheets and one that uses two style sheets. I believe one of these, I could get rid of one of the style sheets though. We'll have to look at the, at the code. Let's look at mobile one. First of all, what can we say about what can we say about the design of pages on a mobile device versus the design of pages on a desktop? What are some observations we can make? Yeah, well, one column. All right. There should only be one column of data on a mobile design. Because you put things side by side, the screen really isn't big enough to handle that. Any other observations? Typically, we want a simpler design because of the smaller screen. We want to make sure there's enough space to click the links. Because again, if the links are too closely spaced, it's hard to click on the exact link that you want. We might want to hide content on a mobile browser. Here's an example. This appears only on the desktop version of this page. And we'll go, here's two of them that appear only on the desktop version. We'll notice in a second when we view this on a mobile emulator that it won't appear in the mobile emulator. So. 
What do I mean by the mobile emulator? Well, uh, the easiest one is build in the Chrome. We click this, go to more tools, developers tools. Notice the magic that happens. We are now viewing the page simulated on a mobile device. A simulated to being on a, on a Galaxy S5. iPhone X, iPad Pro, that's interesting. A pad might be a little bigger, so it might allow for the desktop version, a Moto G4, and so on. Now, notice what we have here. First of all, it's one column layout. Second of all, notice that two of the sections that were uh, that were visible and available on the desktop version are not shown on the mobile version. Let's look at how we do that. First of all, let's look at the HTML. The HTML has two style sheets in it. Notice the second one has something added on to it. This extra thing that's added on is called a media query. You might have seen the results of a media query before. If you ever go to print a page, if you're viewing a web page and you go to print, you might notice that the layout for the print version of the page is different than the version that you see displayed on the screen. They might get rid of background image and they might get rid of colors to make it just plain black and white. And they might, you know, get rid of ads and just in general simplify things. A media query specifies when this style sheet applies. You can have more than one style sheet apply to a page. All right. And you can specify the circumstances under which you're going to use a certain style sheet. So in this case, I'm every web page, every every user is going to get the main CSS. Some users will get this CSS as well. Some users will only get this one. Some users will get both of these CSS uh, files applied. Which users will get the CSS, both CSS applied? The ones that are viewing it on a screen that means computer screen. And the width of the page is at least 800 pixels. That's why if you notice here, when we first bring this page up, we see one version. As we make it narrower, narrower we see the second version. The reason is, is at this point, both of these style sheets apply when we're viewing it at full width. So we get this. When we hit a certain width, then only the first style sheet applies. So when I say media screen, I'm talking about a computer screen. And when I say minimum width 800 pixels, that means it's a screen has to be at least 800 pixels wide for this to apply. If it's less than 600, uh, 800 uh, pixels, this won't apply. Now let's look at the style sheets. Because we have to look at two style sheets.
This particular example uses what's called the mobile first style development. And again, if you're working on a new project, I would recommend that you take this approach. In other words, design how you want it to look on a mobile device first. Then add the bells and whistles to make it work on a desktop device. So there's a couple things that we do for mobile devices. First of all, we put this viewport meta tag in that helps the page display correctly on a mobile device. Then we put in the two respective style sheets. This one is the mobile version. This one is the bells and whistles for the desktop. So what does the mobile version or the base version specify? It specifies as these things, that the body background is yellow. The fonts are Helvetica, Arial, Sans Serif, and so on down the line. Notice that we have anything that is tagged as desktop only, we say on the mobile version is not displayed. So these sections down here that have a class of desktop only, the style rule for that is that we do not display them. That's how we can hide things on the mobile version of the page to make it more simple. Now, think of this, the, the, the second style sheet overrides the first style sheet. So anywhere where there's a style rule for both this and this, the last style rule wins. So the style rule defined in the desktop wins. Let's look at an example of this. The desktop has a display for the header in the desktop version. This says the header has a background that's white. That its grid start column is one, end column is four. The wrapper has a display of grid and so on. These style rules are gonna overrule what's in main. In main, there is no style rule for the wrapper. So of course that one is going to overrule. But the header has a display of width 90%, border one pixel, and so on. This one comes second though. So this style rule is going to apply when this style sheet applies, that is when you're on a computer screen that's at least 800 pixels wide. And we can do that down the line. Notice that nowhere in here, I don't think, do I change the fonts. So the font from the first style sheet never gets overruled. So therefore, the font that's described on the body tag is the fonts that apply to the site, both on a desktop and on a mobile version. The background, though, does change. The background on the, on the mobile version is just a plain color yellow, whereas the background on the desktop version is a background URL bg.png. So again, full version, we get that background. Mobile version, we just get yellow. You actually can go beyond two style sheets if you wanted to. You could develop a style sheet for a desktop version a style sheet for a, a tablet, a style sheet for a mobile version. You could even make a, a low end style sheet for someone that has a flip phone that's viewing your page that would probably have almost no CSS in it at all. Because if you're viewing the page on a very simple phone like that, you're not gonna be able to get elaborate styling. So it doesn't have to end with just two style sheets. 
for each extra style sheet that you add, you specify via the media query what rules apply or when the style sheet applies. And then remember, the rest of the way, it depends on the sequence, which one overrules which. So for example, if I were to flip these around, the page isn't gonna look like how I expected it. All right. Why does it look like that? Because I've changed the order of these, which means that first this gets applied, then this one overrules. And that's not the way we want it. We want first the style sheet that everyone gets to apply, and then we want to overrule it with the bells and whistles that we put in the desktop version of the style sheet. This is sometimes called progressive enhancement. We can specify a baseline for the simplest version our page is gonna look, and then add features as we get to a more involved, uh, a better screen display, either a bigger screen display or uh, not, not a mobile device or, or whatever. Now we can get to the same sort of result by taking the opposite approach. I think I forgot to change this back. There we go. And now it's back to the way I wanted it to be. So progressive, progressive enhancement starts with a baseline adds bells and whistles. The opposite of this is called graceful degradation, where you start with the desktop version, then you take stuff away in the mobile version of the style sheet. Going to get the same result. It's just coming from a different direction. Do I start with a simple and then add stuff? Start with the full version and then take away stuff. Either way, you end up with the same results. <coughs> Generally speaking, it's best to use progressive enhancement if you're doing something from scratch. Just think of it this way, you know, if you wanted, if you wanted to sell, you know, if you wanted to sell cake and you wanted to sell cake that was just plain cake, and you also wanted to sell cake with icing and sprinkles on top, it would be best to start out with a plain cake, cut some of the slices for that, and then add to the rest of the cake icing and sprinkles, as opposed to icing and sprinkles the whole cake, and then on some of the pieces scrape off the icing and sprinkles. They would both kind of get you to the same place, depending on how well you were able to scrape the icing off, but, the more logical approach is to start with the basic and add stuff instead of start with the full version and then take stuff away. The same principles are, are followed here. Okay, if you notice, this one only has the one CSS file. I thought I did it that way. So it does not need this desktop file. This one actually builds the uh, media queries right in the CSS file. So we can either do this with one style sheet file that has the media queries inside it, 
or we can have two external style sheets with the media queries uh, on the style sheet itself. This, in my mind, is six of one, half does the other. It doesn't matter which approach you work. Use which one uh, you think is better. Logically, well, for me, it makes more sense to have two simple style sheets instead of one complicated style sheet. But other people find the other way to be true. So that's just personal preference. So in other words, we define these style rules. Then we say for this situation, we're gonna add these things in. Actually, I lied. This is also progressive enhancement because we're starting with the basic and adding on features. I guess I don't have a graceful degradation example, but you can look one up if you're interested. So everything between this brace and this brace only gets applied if it's displayed on a screen that has a minimum width of at least 800 pixels, as a width of at least 800 pixels. The only time you'd probably use the other technique, graceful degradation, is if you already had a website that worked well on the desktop and you wanted to trim it down for mobile. The best web pages, I would argue, are designed from mobile on up. You know, especially given the fact that um, more people visit website, more people are beginning to visit websites from their phone than from a desktop computer anyhow. It's amazing how many days I don't even break out my computer unless I have to do work, right? If I'm just doing my own sort of browsing, I'll either use an app or I'll use uh, the, the, the mobile browser to, to view web pages that I want to look at. Are there any questions about any of this? Let's look at your assignment. That is, I'm not sure when it's due. Okay, this one is, if you haven't finished this one yet, which is due Wednesday, I would suggest using different styles of layouts. In other words, try it with a grid layout, try it with a flex box layout, or try it with a floating in a flex box or whatever. That'll give you a good sense of how you use those different alternatives. The assignment that's due next week, though, you are to make a web page about good design principles for mobile web development. So we've already done a page uh, about just good web design principles in general. I want you to look for specific guidelines for mobile web development, and that will include all the things that we've talked about today and probably some more stuff. Keep it simple one column design, and so on. Now, here's a key thing. Your page should itself be an example and use media queries, responsive techniques, and progressive enhancement to make the page look different on a mobile compared to a desktop browser. That's important, all right? You do what we did in this example of creating two CSSs or one CSS that includes media queries that will display the page differently on a mobile versus a desktop device. Responsive technique simply means use percentages for the most part instead of fixed numbers. You're then again gonna create a second page about web accessibility guidelines and we'll start talking about those next week in class. All right, are there any questions? Okay, that's all I had for today. Uh, let me know if you have any questions as you're working through these. Um, if not, uh, take care, good luck on the assignments, and we'll see you next week.